on the one hand, there's the question of what kind of a society the Soviet Union is. And I think we would, I, I doubt if either of us would disagree in any serious way with what Marshall just said. You know, it's a highly repressive society which has a kind of social contract that puts a floor under certain kinds of suffering. Okay, that's the kind of society it is. Separate question is what kind of a threat it poses. Those are se very entirely separate questions. I mean, you could have the most brutal, murderous society internally, which just wouldn't happen to be a threat out outside. You have the freest, it's, in fact, through history, there has been no correlation between, that I can detect, between the internal freedom of a society and its violence and aggression abroad. For example, England was the freest country in the world in the 19th century. And in India, it acted like the Nazis did. You know, the United States is, the, in my view, the most open, politically speaking, forgetting social issues and so on. It's the most open and freest society in the world. And it also has the most brutal record of violence and aggression in the world. Now, these things are just uncorrelated. Now, if you look at the Soviet Union, it seems to me, yes, it is a repressive and, uh, you know, dissent is suppressed. And it's, in my view, it's a dungeon. It's kind of a dungeon with a certain degree of social services. Now, uh, and it, it is also a threat. It's a threat to its, the government. It's a threat to its own population. It's a threat to, in fact, anyone within its reach. But its reach doesn't happen to be very long. I mean, its reach is far shorter than we claim it to be. So for, for, for the population of the Soviet Union, for Eastern Europe, for Afghanistan, uh, the Soviet Union is a real threat. And I don't see how anybody can question that. On the other hand, the United States has created the image of a Soviet threat just for the same reason that they create an image of an American threat as a way for us to justify intervention and aggression in our own domains. And in fact, if you look over the history of the Cold War, I think this is transparent. Take any incident of the Cold War, you know, from the American in intervention in Greece in 1947 up to today in Nicaragua, and you will find that every single time a Soviet threat has been created and usually fabricated, to justify American intervention. And incidentally, they play precisely the same game. I think many people believe uh, you can't trust the Russians. Uh, they, never, uh, uh, they never abide by treaties. Uh, they never keep their promises. They're really not a nation like other nations. They're not part of the community of nations. They're, they're a How special about trying breed. this? They, the Russians don't keep their promises because they are a nation like other nations. In <laughs> fact, the fact is anyone who believes the promises of any nation state is out of their minds or just doesn't know anything about history. And that includes us and every other one. I, so. I mean, you know, states follow their promises if it's in their interest to do so. And the, the point is to try to create a system of shared interest which will bring about a certain degree of observance to international agreements. The Russians in, in their international behavior behave very much like any other power, including us. I mean, every power, great or small, tries to extend uh, the influence of its, uh, the extent of its degree to coerce and control and penetrate markets and so on and so forth, get resources. Uh, we happen to be the world's most powerful force. In the early post-war period, we were overwhelmingly the world's most powerful force. And therefore, the United States did, in fact, we can easily document this, both in the documentary record and the historical record, the United States did, in fact, set forth on a policy of global domination. Uh, and it succeeded to a surprising extent. Uh, since that period, the, and, and the Russians did so also in their much sp smaller sphere, every society perceives itself or tries to make its public perceive itself as benevolent. I mean, the British were carrying the white man's burden, and the French had a civilizing mission, and the Russians are doing their internationalist duty when they, inter when they invade Afghanistan and the United States is preserving democracy. And all of this, I mean, we are as much interested in democracy as the Russians are interested in socialism. I, in I, fact, we, you know, over and over again have overthrown democratic regimes uh, if they didn't do the kind of thing we wanted them to do. I mean, there has, study after study has revealed the obvious, namely that American support and aid correlates with, essentially, with the improvement of the investment climate. If a country is willing to open itself to our penetration and control our access to resources, allow our corporations to repatriate profits and so on, we will support them. It doesn't matter what kind of regime they have. The United States is opposed, naturally, to any attempt on the part of any society to use its resources for its own purposes, instead of to integrate itself into uh, what we call an open world system, which means a system that's open to American economic penetration and political control. If any society deviates from that, whether it's capitalist, fascist, communist, uh, you know, democratic or whatever, the United States will be opposed to it. Actually, there are two, as far as I can see, there are two forces in the world that uh, are attempting to uh,
carry out the, in my view, quite ludicrous attempt to identify the Soviet Union with communism. One is the Soviet leadership itself, which is trying to exploit the, uh, uh, the positive image of the, uh, uh, of the egalitarian communist tradition for their own benefit. And the other is the United States, the American propaganda system, which, is, uh, which also would like to undermine that egalitarian vision by associating it with Russian totalitarianism.